I think the fourth or fifth year that we've done Fire Talks, this is the fourth year that we've run it. Um, uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Grex. I work for a large DOD contractor during the day, and I like to play at night on my website, novaevasec.com. So there's my plug. Okay, so, you know, the first question is, you know, what are fire talks? So these are basically 15-minute talks, and it's an alternative to the 30 or 60-minute. And kind of the whole philosophy is what I found in a lot of the longer talks, such as the one that Jason Street gives. Wow. You know, <laughs> wow. I'm just kidding. Uh, there's, there's a lot of background that that they build up and then they show the real good stuff at the end. So the idea with the 15 minute theme is you just have 15 minutes and you basically got to, you know, jump right to the meat of your content. My stuff has no good talk anywhere. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're just going to judge and vote the best uh, talk and these both go, these both go on. So we're having them tonight right now, and then Saturday they're going to start uh, whatever time, what, what, what was it, 6.30? <coughs> so they're going to start tomorrow at 6.30. So we have six presentations tonight, and we're going to have six presentations tomorrow. Um, so this is just a little bit of history. So this was actually a picture of the first fire talks. Um, you know, there were a lot of people that set it up, such as Michael Santarcangelo, or Catalyst, and also Mubix. And I think Chris Gates was also involved in it as well, as well as many others. So this, the actual fire talks were held at the end of a hallway. Um, and so, and about the only, uh-oh, okay, there we go. About the only highlight that I can re remember from that was Jack Daniel did this ad hoc talk and it was the inaugural presentation of his sock puppets. So Jack, where are you? No, he's not. All right, there he is. Maybe he can do a reprise. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so then we had 2010, which is Snowmageddon. Um, so we had a, a lot of last minute changes, but in the end, everything worked out. 2011, 2012 went awesome. So now we're up to, t to 2013. Just, just wanted to mention, just give a big thank Thanks to all the volunteers. So there's Jack Daniel, Sarah Clark, uh, Jason Oliver, and Nathy were helping with uh, selecting all the talks that we had uh, recording. We also have Iron Geek over here. So these presentations or these sessions are going to be on his site probably. Well, they're probably there like right now. Okay. You know, he somehow went forward in time and came back or saw something. Um, so we have a timer and security, uh, you know, do we really have, okay. Are the security people here? All right, every, every, everybody's watching, uh, awesome, okay. So security people just make sure that everybody has a badge. Um, kind of forgot that one. <laughs> okay, so the, the, this is our quick schedule. Um, um, thin slicing the black swan. I have no idea what that's about. So then we're going to get. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's some abstract reference. Um, so then we're going to get the smartphone pen test framework. So, yeah, that's going to be Georgia. And then Tom Steele is going to be talking about Squid Shell, which looks awesome. Rogue Clown, where is she? Woo! There she is back, back there. So she's going to be giving a nice quick talk on how to do capture the flags. Joe Klein. All right, so he's going to be doing some IPv6. Or no, no, this is a Time Lord thing. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then the last one is uh, Mrs. Wendy Nather is going to be talking about, and she's right there. And she's going to be talking about, this is going to be a very interesting talk. So anyway. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to start with the presentations. <coughs> Michelle. So. Just the down arrow? Or? Yeah, I guess. Bloop. Yep. Okay. okay. There we go. Some props for the neat swan I found. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michelle Chaburka. My research partner couldn't be here today because he couldn't get a ticket. Um, but I am Michelle Chaburka, 
a senior network security engineer and blogger, I have a podcast called Healthy Paranoia because sometimes they really are out to get you. Um, my top, I usually speak on topics like effective neuroscience and the psychology of decision making. Uh, Ron Reck, my research partner, is formally trained in uh, theoretical syntax. He has a master's in linguistics. He specializes in W3C, semantic web, RDF technology. He's written a book on RDF. Um, he's probably one of the five people that actually understand it. Okay, um, I'm sure everybody has seen that. <laughs> Let's see. Four hours. I get more time, right? Um, okay, so everybody's probably seen this uh, Verizon threat report. Um, I think it's important to note, oh, there are pie charts for those of you in the management realm. Um, I'm sure that makes you, gives you some warm fuzzies. But uh, uh, not, an external party discovers 92% of breaches. An external party. Yikes. Um, then the second one is also from the, uh, I think that's either from Verizon or the Trust Wave threat report that came out. Um, again, it, I'd like to point out that it indicates that attackers had an average of 178.5 days within a victim's organization before detection. So why do we suck? <laughs> why, why, are we not, why aren't we getting this better? It sounds like you know, we have big data, we have you know, all these fancy IDSs. Um, I like to think of us more like security archaeologists. So a black swan event, hence my catchy title. It's, Nassim Taleb call, calls it the unknown unknown. It can't be pr predicted by probability theories. How often do we try to predict black swan events in security and <coughs> fail miserably? This is an interesting statistic, well, line that I came across from um, a defense analyst. Military drone operators amass untold amounts of data that never fully or get fully analyzed because it's too much. So we have all these wonderful drones and we can't keep up with the data. Um, this gives you an idea of how much data we're talking about. So from the beginning of recorded time until 2003, five exabytes of information. 2011, that much was created every two days. 2012, the prediction was every 10 minutes. Um, this is from Dave Turek. He's in charge of the supercomputer development at IBM. He refers to this uh, as digital kudzu, and if anybody knows what kudzu is, it was a perennial brought into the U.S. to uh, prevent soil erosion, and it went crazy. Okay, so what are the current solutions that we use for this problem? The security <laughs> issue is a SIM. Yay, a SIM. Everybody loves their SIMs. Um, predictions, we use logist logistic regression, Bayesian probability. Uh, huge amounts of data, we don't have enough time to process it all. Basically, one of the issues that I see with this is that we have an open world problem, but we're using closed world solutions, closed world assumptions on these problems. Um, more staff, more money. Here's my proposal for an alternative model. Um, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called uh, Blink. And he talks about a concept called uh, thin slicing, the ability of our unconscious to find patterns in situations and behavior based on very narrow slices of experience. For example, a fly ball. When you, when you catch a fly ball, you do not calculate the trajectory of the ball. You're using a gaze heuristic to catch the ball. These are based on evolved capacities of uh, tr motion tracking with your eyes and balance, the ability to move and balance. Here is an application of thin slicing. It was mentioned in Malcolm Gladwell's book. It's a case study of Cook County Hospital in Chicago. And if you've ever seen ER, that's what uh, it was based on Cook County Hospital. Um, the coronary care unit was overwhelmed by people coming in that who had complained of chest pains or some other kind of symptom that gave the impression they might be at risk of a heart attack. 
And the doctors could not reliably, above just the basic chance factor, decide whether or not they were actually going to have a heart attack. It's a public hospital. They had limited resources. So there was a, a, a cardiologist named Lee Goldman who had created a protocol based upon an algorithm developed in partnership with some mathematicians. Cook County Hospital decided to implement this, this technique, and after two years of using a decision tree, hospital staff were 70% more effective at recognizing patients at risk. This is a situation where less information led to greater success. And I'd like you to re remember that every time you walk into a hospital, they're dealing with highly, highly complex problems. You go to the emergency room, they're not, okay, what's your history? Oh, wait, no, we need to get a little more data about the kind of, you know, problem this is. They're triaging you, they're getting you into an emergency as soon as possible. This is how first responders do it every day. This is an example of the typical green and mare uh, fast and frugal tree. Um, on, the, on the left, A, you see that's a typical uh, cardiac care fast and frugal tree. On the right, that's for determining whether or not somebody should get bail. That's how it's been applied. Basically, a fast and frugal tree is different than a full decision tree like as the ones that NASA use. The ones that NASA uses are information greedy. A fast and frugal tree is comprised of a search rule, a stopping rule. So the search rule looks up the factors of importance. The stopping rule stops the search if a factor allows it. And then the decision rule, classify the object according to this factor. It's a way to codify intuition that's informed by empirical data. So Ron and I uh, came up with an application uh, the, we decided to use some semantic web technologies, the resource description framework. Um, what I found interesting was the, this is a triple, these are two triples actually in, in RDF, and it looks, uh, an edge looks very much like a fast and frugal tree. Um, they're based on, it's object oriented, it's based on relationships or mental associations. What we did was we used packet captures um, and the graphs treat each packet from a capture file as a discrete event with properties. The TCP header info is in a metadata model. Um, it's an attempt to replicate human cognitive economy. Um, it, we put this in, an, in a virtuoso database which uses Sparkle. Um, so we used the Sparkle query language for, in order to traverse these large data sets while capturing similarities. Um, if you don't know RDF, it's basically subject, predicate, object. Subject defines the event. Predicate defines a characteristic of that event. And the object contains the actual value. Okay, this is supposed to be an animated slide. We'll see if it works. There you go. Here is the pseudocode for that. Subject, predicate, object. It's basically SQL, but slightly enhanced. So there's event one. There's the property of event one source that we're looking for. And then we report on it. Here's an example of uh, all source IPs and their destination IPs. For each source, count how many times it went to a destination. Report source, destination, and count. Um, it also has a web interface, uh, Virtuoso, and that gives you an idea um, it's hard, it's a bit hard to see, but it shows you the, uh, I think it should show you the return time, how long it took to uh, respond for that query. It's very incredibly, incredibly fast. So uh, we can't fight all the unknowns. And I think that's the shift that has to happen. As I mentioned, we're, we have an open world problem where there's information, a lot of information that we don't know. And when you have complex problems, Complex solutions are great in hindsight, but not in foresight, in prediction, not a complex solution. So we need to focus on building good, strong infrastructures that minimize technical debt. We need to make sure we have defense in depth and we have airbags. Recognize the limitation of IDS and signatures and investigate the creation of real-time fast and frugal trees. Right now, I sort of feel like our patient is dying on the table. Um, 
I know this was a lot to take in. Does anybody, if I have some time, does anybody have any questions? Are we done? Or I have five minutes? Uh, three minutes? Three minutes. Does anybody have any questions about our implementation? Yes. So far, we're, it's in its infancy. It's very complicated to take uh, semantic web technology and apply it to packet captures. Ideally, I would like to see uh, more of a JDL fusion model where we take blobs of data in from multiple resources, not just packet captures. What I'm trying to do is look for patterns that could be a sort of fast and frugal tree. Does that make sense? And I'm, right now, we're still at the exploratory stages. We're, you know, the, the Sparkle queries don't always work the way that we expect, um, but, you know, I, that's, I guess that's what, that's what you do, right? You're, you don't know what you're going to get when you try to take such divergent things and put them together. Yes? Do you have any uh, issues with uh, looking for data that you want out of the queries and cherry picking it using these queries? Yes, I, right now one of our biggest problems is getting data sets, large data sets, and uh, we need them to be tagged and I want to do side-by-side -side comparisons. I'd like to have the same data set use the traditional technology, use our technology, hope and see how well we do at finding the same thing because we're trying to also build an impoverished query, the least you know, the smallest number of parameters that give you, because we don't need to know the, ex oh, this is this time of type of attack. What we want to know is bad. This is worse. This is not so bad. This is the worst. I want to actually have a fast and frugal tree as much as possible. I mean, it sounds, cr I, I know this sounds a little probably pie in the sky to try to hope for that, but that's, that's my desire. In terms of key value, what do you typically get? I'm sorry? In terms of like number of, I mean, right now our error percentage is probably sort of 50%. We're just not, we're, we're not getting those queries quite right. And we don't have enough data to really, we have, we're working with really old data sets from like 10 years ago, because that's all we can get. I'm sorry? Yeah, and it's taking a lot of time and it, it, time that, you know, our day jobs don't necessarily give us to do. Yes. You know, I, the, I knew that was going to come up, and uh, no, I, ideally, I mean, how do you teach a machine to use heuristics? I mean, like, a, but real heuristics, smart heuristics of jumping to conclusions, of take the best, all those kinds of, you know, really simple heuristics. I, I don't know. I, I'm looking for research partners, so. <laughs> If, you, if you're interested, please let me know in a way to get a better application of this. This is, you know, a first run, so um, thank you. I appreciate it. You can, uh, here's my blog and podcast. You can, uh, all my references. Thank you. It looks funny on my screen. I'm not really sure what that means. Okay, so I have to do this, right? All right. Hey, everybody. I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to throw it up right on the stage. So. Oh, gross. All right. Now, with that, I have a little something I have to say. So I'm going to climb up here on this chair. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to do it. Okay, so here's the thing. Everybody in InfoSec is really mean to one another, and they've been really mean to one of my best friends, so I have something to say. I love Joe McCray! All right, so let's talk about SPF. You're not capturing my slides. I think it's it's so it's flashing back and forth on the slides. I'm not sure what you're doing. I'm sorry, it's all my fault. It's, I'll like re-record it for you later. Okay. All right. So, 
Who here has heard of the smartphone pen test framework? All right, most people. So it's a little, oh, I forgot my mask. There we go. All right. <laughs> so it's a little framework I built for testing smartphones. And a lot of people had a lot of really not nice things to say about it. So I listened, and I fixed all the things you didn't like and made all the things you wanted. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yay. How do you make it go? OK, there we go. All right. So the goal of SPF, I want to simulate basically the threat of bring your own device, make it such that you can, as a pin tester, the same way you simulate, OK, you have MSO8067 unpatched. I can get system on your box. You have an Android that's like Android 2.2 in your environment. What does that mean? So I actually want to perform those real attacks on your customers' devices in a way where you can just say, OK, do this, as opposed to building it yourself. Because, you know, pen testers can't code. What are you talking about? Not the goals of SPF. I'm not writing a bunch of O days for smartphones, unfortunately. I'd love to, but I'm not that smart, so that's that. And I'm also not an exploit hub for jailbreaks. A lot of people write me and they say, why don't you have all of the iPhone jailbreaks in your tool? Most of the iPhone jailbreaks require you to have USB access, which if you have USB access, that's not really simulating much of anything except a stolen phone. So while I could put them in there, they wouldn't really be good for what I'm trying to do. We're looking client-side attacks, remote attacks, social engineering. Can we get somebody to download my app? And if we can, what happens? Can I get them to go to my web page? You know, the good stuff. So post-exploitation agents. I would like to quote Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this group of Perl scripts isn't good for anything. Who uses the Android permission model to do anything malicious? Well, I'd like to tell you, who does malicious things with the Android permission model? The attackers do. So we as pen testers need to do the same thing. So we actually now have... Android doesn't consent. What? <laughs> I don't know anything about rape. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. So we actually have three options for our post-exploitation now. We have our permission-based agent. So you can drop something on their device that asks for permissions. And if they accept it, it, shall we say, rapes their device. <laughs> yeah. That's actually the interesting thing. The only thing you have to have in order to drop a binary on the device and start talking to the internal network is network access. You don't have to have root. So yeah, we could drop an agent that just has network. That's actually number three. So you can actually drop an agent that doesn't ask for any permissions except for the original app permissions. Plus, of course, it has to have network access, which most of them do. They have to, I don't see very many apps that don't have internet access, you know, that won't set anybody off. But then you can start dropping binaries and start scanning their internal network from an Android app. So all the people who say, oh, you should be running more routing programs, they don't know what they're talking about because you don't have to have root to start scanning the internal network. I can scan your internal network from any app on your phone. So we have our permission-based agent. I also have one that does run all the routes. We have everything from Rage Against the Cage all the way to that Exynos thing that happened for S3 for all the Exynos chips. So all of the known routes that are out there are on there. So it'll just try everything kind of Droid Dream style. It'll check what version you have and anything that might work against your version. It tries, and then it puts a root app on there. So then you have root privileges, and who cares? And we also have the third option where we don't do either of the above. We just put an agent on there that has network access, and we can use it to scan the internal network. And we can even drop Metasploit for ARM if we want to. So I think it's cool. I don't know what Reddit's deal is. All right. So we're going to build some custom agents. So I want to backdoor any Android app. When I first put out. SPF, a lot of people were like, oh, I have to start up Eclipse, and I have to import your project, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. I listened. All right, you don't want to have to do that. So all you have to do is click a button, and you can build the Android agent now. Also, you can backdoor any app that you have the source code for. So say the company's internal app. 
grab the source code for it, backdoor it, send it to them. Easy as pie. So it's not anything like it takes the app itself and backdoors it. Though maybe someday I'll get around to doing that. But basically it acts like your app. It looks like your app. It actually is your app. It just has a backdoor in it, which is exactly what the attackers are doing. That's what Droid Dream and everything since then has done. So that's what we should be simulating. That's what's walking into your environment, right? So that's what we should be trying to do. I think so it also acts a little bit like my app. So let's actually do some demos now. How am I on time? Uh, I'm not recording. You're not recording? I'm recording your talk. <laughs> right? I'm not recording that time. Okay. Eight minutes. All right. So let's see if we can get Fusion to work now. I'm sorry. Uh, this time. All right, so I have two backtracks. Which one is the one I need? I'm going to say it's that one. I did a base install of backtracks, so you can see how easy this is. Don't upgrade. Yeah. All right, so we're going to start up backtrack, and all I did previously on backtrack, I haven't done anything else to it except download SPF and run the backtrack installer. So this is how simple this is. It wasn't supposed to be turned off, mind you. But, you know, projectors are lame. All right. So I should have an IP address. All right, cool. So I'm going to start up SPF. And, of course, I need some phones to attack. So let's just grab some Android emulators, which obviously I should have started before everything. This just keeps getting better and better, doesn't it? I don't have it. Well, I have this. This will do. I had some of that earlier. It was gross. Where's Eclipse? Eclipse starts with an E. <laughs> there it is. Oh, come on, tell me you aren't enjoying yourself right now. <laughs> yeah. Tell me this isn't the best thing you've seen all day. Oh, they brought me another shot. You want me to fall on my face? <laughs> really, you do? God. <laughs> Open Sesame. Unfortunately, computers don't listen to that. I guess I need my eight minutes to like turn on my demos. This thing only has a gazillion RAM. It has a gazillion RAM. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Gazillion. All right, so I started up a couple emulators here. All right, so while that's starting up, all right, so I actually have something called Maps Demo again. If you've done any Android development, like one of the things that Google gives you is you can make basically the Maps app. They give you the code and you can use it as a demo. So that's all that this is. So I just want to import it into SPF so it's straight from the Maps Demo. I could sh It's right there, but that's where that's all it is, you can believe me. So I can actually import that in. Actually, let me make sure it's not already imported. See how prepared I am for my talk. What? Stop talking. Words. <laughs> it's Rams. All right. Yeah, it was already in there. All right. So it just grabs everything that's from that folder so I can actually import any template I want. So as long as I have the source code of the Android app, it will backdoor it for me. So I just need to tell it where it is on the box. Let's make that a little bigger so you guys can see it. There we go. Maps demo again. What do I want to call it? I can call it whatever I like. And it does want to know its main activity. I haven't really figured out, because in some cases, the manifest is kind of complicated about what is the main activity. So basically, I just want it to call SPF off the bat. So I just give it what is the package of the main activity. 
So com.example.android.apis.maps.demo is what it is for maps demo. So I just tell it that and it builds it. Then I can actually generate the app so it will put the SPF agent with all of your nasty permission things and backdoors in it. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to do any crazy programming. All right, so which one do I want to use? You can just do a blank front end like I used to demo. It also has the maps demo, and this one that I just pulled in is maps demo again. So I say number three, and then what do I want for the information for the app? So who do I want it to answer to? Um, so I'll just give it a phone number. I'm going to do this all over HTTP, but it can also answer over SMS, so completely out of bounds. Um, what do I want its control key to be, and where do I want it to answer on the server? Android Agent 3 works for me, and it will actually use Android SDK to build that app right there on the fly, and you have a malicious app. You know, I may not be that cool, but damn it, all you have to do is push buttons! <laughs> Let them say what they want. All you have to do is push buttons. I'm not angry. I'm not angry about what they said about me. Nope. All right, so I have the, we've seen in demos previously where you like send it a text message and they download the app or they go to a client side and end up with it through drive by download. But, you know, I couldn't deal with any more demo failure. So also if you've got like an iPad that doesn't have a modem or one of those Nexus 7s, we can also just like dump it on our web server. So where do I want to put it? This is Firetalks, so I'll just call it Firetalks. And I want to call it app.apk, whatever I want to call it. And it copies it over to the web server, though I should probably start the web server. <laughs> I was not prepared to stop my computer. <laughs> You're the one who got me drunk. <laughs> you love it. You know you love it. Don't let Charlie Miller tell you otherwise. I read his tweet. All right, so where's my Android? So let's see. Let's grab an Android here. Here's one. It probably already has an Android agent on it. No, the worst part was I couldn't get my agent to work and then I realized that it, it had Droid Dream on it. So it was actually overriding itself with Droid Dream. That was kind of complicated. I spent a couple days on that one. Yeah, it's on there already. Uninstall. <coughs> All right, not Internet Explorer or Safari or whatever. All right, you're not laughing. All right, so then I want to, for some social engineering reason, they go to this thing and open Sesame. I hate Mac for another reason that it doesn't hook up to the Android keyboard at all, basically, anymore. And I called this Firetalks, which I can hopefully spell. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> You know, remember this when you're voting. At least you laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Who wins the fire talks? I gotta beat Travis Goodspeed. <laughs> Woo! Didn't you go to school with me? Yeah, <laughs> 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 and we can install the app. And this is a permission-based app, so it does ask for permissions like that ever stopped anybody. Oh, we can do that one. Do you want me to start over? Yeah, you and like nobody else ever. What did I put as the IP address on this thing? Okay, so I did put it in right? Okay, good. I'm just checking if I haven't screwed myself. If anybody watched my Black Hat demo, I totally put, I screwed myself on that one, so. So, what did I say? Android Agent 3, right? No, I said, f no, I don't remember. I think. Okay. 
And I said, key, key one. So it needs to know like how to talk to it and where to talk to it, but the rest it'll fill in for itself. So if you've watched previous demos of SPF, this is much better. You have to do a lot less. So unfortunately, this is the part where it takes a minute because like when you do the framework Android app, you can just click them both. With this one, we have to wait for it to check in because we don't own it. The actual customer does. So I guess I'll take my shot now. God. Yeah, we're going to go to the ER together. <laughs> Alcohol poisoning. Are you sure you went to JMU? I went to JMU for grad school. That's different. <laughs> I did not go to those JMU undergrad parties by any means. So apparently when I restarted my computer, my slides went all wonky because there was supposed to be a slide that said how you can contact me. But if you don't know how to contact me, then there, see, there's the agent in there, and then we can start sending it stuff. But I'm probably out of time, yes? Dude, send it one thing. Well, it didn't pull it in. Oh. I fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, but that's the old one. Number two didn't pull it in, so that means I did screw it up. <laughs> Woo! If you're not drunk, it works! <laughs> If you're not drunk, SPF works. <laughs> so at the very least, we've backdoored apps. And they should hook up to SPF, though it doesn't appear to have here. So I screwed up. But you can, at that point, like the other part of the demo that I don't have time for because it didn't work, is we can, I was going to drop an in-map binary on it, scan the internal network, so basically scan all of you, and then pull it back up to SPF. So Adrian, just kill the feed. <laughs> all right, so do you still love me? Because I'm not perfect, do you still love me? All right, so I wasted enough of your time. Good night, everyone. I love you. All oh, right, this. <laughs> okay, great. So, all right. Hello, everyone. I am Tom Steele. I work for Fishnet Security. And yeah, I go Fishnet. And uh, this is Shell Squid Distributed Shells with Node. Okay, so we all love shells. Right? And this is typically what we do. We get reverse payloads, right? Like, we use them. They work. So we send our msf.exe, our generic, you know, by payload to uh, Brian here. And he runs it. And his firewall is denying all but allowing outbound 80 and four, or 443. And maybe he's even used a proxy. But hey, we're using Meterpreter, and it works. And we're awesome, and we get shells. Sweet. But here comes the problem. You need an IP and a port on the internet for that to work. And at Fishnet, I work with 20 consultants who are all really good at their job and who get lots of shells. And when 20 consultants attack 20 targets, you would need how many IPs? One. <laughs> 20. But you didn't say you were a mathematician. Yes. So we all want to use, so the problem is that all of us as consultants want to use, um, we all want to use port 443. And it so happens that my team has a lab with not 20 machines, but around three machines that we use for reverse handlers. I'm sorry? I'm going to keep going, but we'll talk later. <laughs> anyway. Um, so we all want to use our own handler, and we all want to use 443. So some of the solutions that we came up, that we were kind of talking about, is using our own payload, stager, handler, all that, and kind of being able to share it. So we were kind of tooling around with developing our own things. So we wouldn't have to share handlers or try other things. Um, or we could try share a handler, downvote that. Um, Armitage and Cobalt Strike, I think, have some really cool stuff in them with like sharing sessions and passing around handlers. I just haven't played with it, and I don't think it's, it would fit our use, because we like to keep, um, we're attacking you know, real clients here, getting real customer data. 
So we want to keep it as separate as we can, um, not sharing anything. And the other thing that, that we could do is just wait. So if uh, you know, the other consultant's using that IP and that port and that handler, just wait for him to be done with his project and then, okay, you're, you're, you're uh, done, I can move on. Or we could try another port like 80 or 21 or something that's common to be allowed by outbound um, by egress filtering. So we didn't like any of these solutions. And so I was thinking one night, um, hey, we could just use a reverse proxy. So we have one handler listening on the perimeter, and then we have a bunch of internal handlers listening anywhere. And then the reverse proxy like Apache, Nginx, or um, like Squid or something can just say, hey, you're this target, route to this handler. And that's, that, that works, that actually works. It's really cool. You can, if you um, go write Apache rules for like a certain remote IP address or a certain domain name, um, you can kind of route it anywhere. But that's not dynamic enough and it doesn't really work unless you know everything about the target for, to, to begin with. Um, so enter the real solution, um, Shell Squid. This is a program that is built using mainly Node and a really cool module from the guys at Node Jitsu called HTTP Proxy. So um, probably wouldn't have been able to build, be built without them, without a lot of work. Um, it uses Mo a MongoDB on the back end to kind of track all this data and it uses AngularJS for kind of some client side templating and um, handling all the real time information that comes through. Um, and yeah, this talk doesn't have a lot, but it has a really long demo. So let's try this. <laughs> okay, so um, first, let's just take a quick look at the configuration file for this. Out of that. Okay, so the configuration file is just a, a JSON file, and um, so Shell Squid has two pieces: a web API for controlling it and a proxy. So you want you want your proxy listening on the perimeter IP, and that's going to be my VMware IP here. So it's not the perimeter IP, but it will act as one. And I'm going to have the web API listening on localhost, but you probably want to have it listening on your internal interface, so all your different team could. Um, operate with it. And since we're using SSL, we need a certain a key. And um, it also has a default handler. So if for some reason like stray shells come in, you still want to get those in a, a default handler port. And it also has this, this, and this is the kind of the main reason why it actually works, is um, you put alphanumeric shellcode in the shellcode piece, and I will show why that works. Um, and so yeah, just you put alphanumeric shellcode in there. So I have my database running. All right, shell squid is going. Okay, so it looks kind of weird at this resolution and I do apologize for that, at least on my screen. Um, but just a tour of the interface real quick. It just has a, you know, a quick um, message showing your default handler. It will look at all your handlers too and let you know if they're alive or down. So right now the default one is down, so it's red. Uh, as requests hit the proxy, sometimes it's nice to see those coming in, so you'll see them streaming in. And it will also let you know, um, it'll kind of keep track on the client how many sessions it's seen and, and give you a, a track of those. And it also gives you um, your targets as well. So let's set up some handlers. Okay, so enter next problem. Um, the Metasploit handler for reverse HTTPS, every single time it connects back, the handler or the payload sets the URL for whatever you had localhost to. So when I was originally doing this, I was working and I was working on it and I was like, oh man, that worked, like that's awesome. And then I looked at the connection and it wasn't actually going through my proxy. It was going through my proxy on the initial connection and then going around. So that's like, well that's not ever gonna work in like a real environment. So. I had to kind of slightly edit and add about two lines of code to the built-in stager and built-in handler in Metasploit, and those are available for download. But um, they're called proxy HTTPS and proxy HTTP. And they just take a couple more um, settings than, than the usual payload. It takes a proxy host and a proxy port, so it will set that URL for the proxy instead of your host. Okay, so that's running. 
And then let's, set, let's pretend like we're targeting a real company and we'll set up our own handler as here. So I have another handler um, running on port 10,000. And you can see the listener is actually on my local host, so it's not on the same IP space as our perimeter. Okay. So if you go to our app, you can see that, hey, the handler's green because it's alive. And we'll just create a new one, so I'll call this Shmoo. I'm Tom. Hey guys, let's hope this works. Um, and what, what port? 10,000, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. That's 10,000. Okay. I'm sorry? 100,000. Was it 100,000? You're lying to me. You're such a jokester, you. It was 10,000. Okay, so um, other options here. It actually can work by domain name. We're not going to use the domain name option, but if you set your payload, to use a certain subdomain or like a fully qualified domain name, it will actually work. So that's cool. Um, and you can, you can give it the non, like a, a non-default shellcode, but for the most part, the default shellcode is just gonna work because this is for Windows. It, you could use other payloads as well, but as long as they're HTTPS aware, but we're just gonna stick with the default. So we create that and it's populated and like the handlers are both green, cool. Um, you can like click this and view. Um, toward the interface real quick, these are all like searchable, right? So like you can search real quick. Like if you had, if you had 20 people using the same interface, you, you know, it's, it, this becomes really good. Okay. So now, if our session's listening, let's uh, look up a Windows box here. I want the other one. All right. So now, in turn, how this actually works. So I created a payload based off of, um, off of a, a, um, a basically a, a generic kind of C-sharp.net um, payload that injects shellcode into memory. Um, what I did with it is took it and made it so the shellcode gets pulled over HTTPS, so for a little bit more obfuscation from AV, so in case AV ever like keys in on some string or something and that's in there, um, it works. So what it does is it hits this URL, which is basically, you can figure it to hit this URL, which is your proxy IP slash DL slash ID. Um, which is just this unique ID here. Um, and so if you look at it, no remote IPs right now. And I'm gonna simulate it just because I don't wanna like have you watch me compile stuff, it's weird. Okay, so that's cool. Um, it goes to the proxy, says, hey, I'm looking for the shellcode for this unique identifier. Give me the shellcode. And so internally, your payload will do this if you use my payload. If you don't want to use my payload, um, somehow you're just going to have to make a call to register your remote IP with the, by calling the download or use a domain name. So you get this good message that's like, hey, shellcode deployed to this target. Awesome. And when you click here, you see the request for shellcode is one, and all of a sudden, you know, your target IP gets added to remote IPs. So now any subsequent requests that come in f from this remote IP will be forwarded on to the correct handler, which is 10,000. Okay, and now the fate of live demos is actually testing this out. So we'll try like a generic payload here. Um, and there is some weird latency with the internal VMware network. Um, I have a video online where I'm like launching hundreds of shells and there is no latency between the VMware network. Um, it's not the proxy. Um, I don't know why that is. I'm sorry, it's just the VM how VMware is right now. I, really weird. But cool, we have a new session and you're seeing all the Metasploit requests come in and the session count has increased by one and you can like disable logging if you want to, like that works because that might get annoying looking at all those things scroll by. Um, and you can interact with it. You hope. Cool. Shell through the proxy. Um, and like I said, I would, I would really love to show you guys just me clicking da 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 and like literally thousands of shells just streaming by. VMware.
cool door, cool story, bro. Like it's not working. Um, but like uh, the default handler works. So like if I click here. Should eventually get a shell. Thank you, VMware. Yeah, okay. So session opened on the default handler, so it works. Cool. So now we have a session on the default handler and the shmoo handler. Um, I've tested this with about 20 targets based on like all the, inf the, the, uh, the VMs I could pull on my network and um, literally launching hundreds of shells. and. Um, I don't, I don't know how much everyone knows about Node, but Node's really fast at network I.O., so it works really well. Um, and that's kind of the demo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and as you probably noticed when I pulled up the web page, as my coworkers notified me today, and I, did, like, I didn't already know it, um, no auth. I didn't build it in yet. I'm going to build it in. Don't freak out. So there's no auth yet. Um, my advice to you is to put it behind SSH and use SSH port forwarding for, for now, or submit a pull request with auth built in. Um, thank you to, for you guys letting me talk. Thanks for approving my talk. And thank, I want to say thank you to my company for sending me here to let me give the talk. Here's my contact info if you would like to get a hold of me. There's my email, my Twitter, and the link to my GitHub where I have some, some more code besides this, and the link to Shell Squid, of course. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? That's a good question. So I get asked that quite frequently. I'm a big fan of not writing SQL because I feel like I'm more productive that way. I don't care about scale. I care about Oh, I can put an object in the database and get an object out. And if you don't think that's cool, use Postgres. Anyone else? Yes. The web interface is bootstrap. Um, but you notice it didn't look very bootstrap y. I spent a lot of time designing that. I am not a web designer, but I spent weeks making that pretty. So I wanted it to make it look good. And I'm really tired of seeing black nav bar, white background, nav well. So no more, if you're going to use Bootstrap, change the font, change the background, do some cool stuff. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Nicole Newlist, or Rogue Clown. I answer to just about anything, I promise. And <laughs> and <laughs> like I said, just about anything. And I'm here to talk about capture the flag. And you know, you might be wondering, hey, um, why capture the flag? That's for all those leet hacksaws who sit in the rooms with the loud techno and the headphones and type, 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 and don't actually socialize at cons at all. Totally not true. <laughs> What Capture the Flag does require a few things. Um, it requires creativity. I mean, the problems are weird, and I'll get more a little later into the kinds of problems that you see in Capture the Flag and why they're so weird. But, you know, you need to think around them. You need to be curious. You need to figure out, okay, this isn't something I've seen before, but how do I research? How in the world do I solve it? You need persistence. You need to be able to whack your head against the problem and whack your head against the problem and try different things and not give up. Because if the CTF lasts for three days and you go, oh, I can't solve any of this in like five minutes, it's, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun and you're not going to capture very many flags. However, being leet is not required. This isn't going to be, you know, somebody who's won a bunch of capture the flags and has a wall full of DEF CON black badges telling you how to do capture the flag. No, that's not me. Um, I've done a few capture the flags, but I wouldn't say I'm the best person on my team. I'd say I'm probably one of the worst people on my team, but I'm there to learn, and I've learned a few things along the way. I mean, my first capture the flag was actually here at ShmooCon four years ago at ShmooCon 5. 
I did the hacker halo capture the flag and was awful at the halo. Like, I think I scored zero points at the halo. The hack, I got a few of the points, but even then, I mean, I was so nervous about, oh my goodness, you know, I've only been hacking for like not even a year. Everyone's going to think I'm stupid. So I'm just going to be my own one person team and do what I can. That was a bad idea for a couple of reasons. So what in the world are you going to have thrown at you for a CTF? There are two main types of CTFs. One is generally called Jeopardy style, and it's called Jeopardy style because you have a bunch of different problems in a bunch of different categories. The other is the classic, more attack and defense kind of CTF. Um, most of the CTFs I've done to date have been the Jeopardy style, but I did my first attack and defense CTF on a team back in November of last year. It's called the RUCTFE, and I did it with a group from MISEC, Michigan Security. And it was really cool because we not only had teams that were trying to figure out what was wrong with various you know, website services, but also you know, trying to patch our running instances of it. It was my first experience with a live attack and defense CTF. And I mean, there's pluses and minuses to both. I like the fact that I have time to just kind of sit and think through the Jeopardy style problems. But there's something that gets your adrenaline going with those classic style ones as well. They're both fun, and they're both worth it. Now, what kinds of stuff are you going to see in a CTF? Crypto, exploitation, forensics, programming, reverse engineering, trivia, web applications. If it's something that anyone talks about at a conference, if, you know, be it in a talk or, heck, even in the hallway track. I've seen problems on CTFs that are like, Give me this piece of trivia about the movie Hackers. Give me this feature that was released in such and such version of such and such software. Just super goofball stuff. And some of it is easily Googleable. Some of it is not. And, you know, you have to figure it out. Forensics, there's different kinds of categories of forensics that I've seen. I've seen you know, log analysis, packet forensics, you know, drive forensics. So. That's one of the really nice things about CTF and one of the good reasons to get involved in CTF is there's a little bit of something for everyone. If you want to get better at something that you're already good at, chances are you're going to find something in a CTF. If you want to explore learning something that you don't know yet, chances are you're going to find it in a CTF. And you know, even though you might feel a little bit of the adrenaline, a little of the pressure of the competition, it's not in a live environment or in a client environment or in an environment that anyone's going to expect anything more of you than spend some time trying to get some flags. What kind of tools do you need for CTF? You probably already have them. Um, I've got some virtual machines that I use for CTFs. I have, uh, you know, my Backtrack 5 VM is the one that I use more often than anything just because I'm comfortable in a Linux, Linux environment. Um, I also have a Windows one that I use mainly because you'll sometimes see Windows reversing type challenges on there, you know, PE executables, .NET reversing, and obviously that's a little easier to do on a Windows environment. Um, I do highly suggest running it in virtual machines, um, one, because of, you know, it's nice to go back to a snapshot if that's how you like to work. But two, sometimes, you know, kind of figuring out what's going on in these CTF problems, especially exploitation, reverse engineering type stuff, you're going to be running random pieces of code that other hackers who are running the CTF have provided you. It's probably not malicious, but why take a chance? Um, another thing to you know, know for a CTF, Scripting languages, really useful. Um, I script most of my solutions in Python. Um, I don't care if you use Python, Perl, Ruby, Shell Script, PowerShell. Doesn't matter what language you use, just know at least one because, like I said before, CTF organizers are tricky. It's not like they're going to be throwing you know, known exploits and known software at you. It's a lot, a lot of times custom applications that they've developed just to be tricky. And so throwing all the exploits in the book at it and seeing what sticks, not going to fly. Um, as far as utilities, pretty much any kinds of utilities that you're comfortable using, use it. I mean. I use my hex editor quite a bit when I'm doing capture the flag, hex editor, text editor, um, 
you know, Wireshark I use quite a bit if it's anything involving packets or traffic. Um, I could go on and on. This is only a 15 minute talk and that would be really boring for me to stand there and be like, I use this tool, I use that tool, and I'm not here to put you to sleep. So yeah, anything that you're comfortable using, anything that you're interested in learning, anything that you think might be applicable to that problem that you're trying to solve, use it. As far as stuff you're not gonna use, you know, scanners, vulnerability scanners, you know, I've never used, never used Nessus, never used Nexpose, never used, I don't use Metasploit framework, anything like that. They totally have their place in real life pen tests, but, in general, capture the flag isn't a real life pen test. Capture the flag is often, you know, solving, solving custom problems that people have created and they kind of want to see how you attack it. It's not the normal, you know, MSO8067 all day, every day. Now, I said earlier that I did my first CTF alone. That was really stupid. Please join a team, don't be shy about it. Um, I have here a list of some of the people that I've captured some flags with on my sec. It's not a complete list, but I love you all, my sec. Um, people are not going to laugh at you if you don't know anything. People are not going to laugh at you if you don't know the answers to everything. That's what I was so afraid of when I started doing CTFs. And the best way to do it is just get over yourself. The nice thing about being on a team is, you know, there'll be people who have varying experience. Everything from, I've never done a CTF before, I'm just getting started in security, all the way to, I've been in security for years and years and years and I've lost count of how many CTFs I've done. And that's great because it means if you're new to CTF, you can learn from your teammates. Also, you know, you probably have teammates, let's say you have teammates who know a lot about programming or know a lot about reverse engineering, but may not know quite so much about crypto or network forensics, and you might bring that knowledge to the table. So, you know, focus on what, what you can bring to the CTF team, what you know, or what you're able to do. You know, if you, if you can contribute, you know, eight hours and some creativity, that's awesome. And like I said, CTF organizers are tricky and the worst possible thing in a CTF is to run out of ideas. Um, sometimes I get really cranky when I'm doing a C you know, weekends that I'm doing CTFs. I get really annoying. You probably really don't want to deal with me and it's good that I'm kind of hiding in my basement apartment and nobody can see me because I've run out of ideas. I'm pissed off and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so pissed. Th this just needs to end or ugh. And that happens so much less when I'm on a team because I can at least be like, here, I've got these ideas, you know, I'll talk to them on IRC or post them on DRADIS, D-R-A-D-I-S, which is a really nice framework for laying out notes. You know, you make a file folder for each CTF problem and people can take notes and edit notes and post files and collaborate. It's really nice if you're not all in the same place or, you know, most of the CTF teammates are in Michigan and I'm not. <laughs> but you know, instead of getting frustrated that you're running out of ideas, you have people to hash it out with. And that leads me into my next point. Try all kinds of weird stuff. When I started doing CTFs, I would get an idea, and if my, you know, first or second crack at it was, you know, not going, you know, didn't work. It's like, oh, you know, it wasn't this kind of encryption. Oh, it wasn't that kind of encoding. I'm sick of this, I'm gonna move on. Um, that's not, that's not the way to do it. You know, try and figure out it might not be this. It could be a little different. You know, the key might not be the name of the capture the flag. The key might be the name of the organizers or the name of the con that it's associated with. Just keep thinking of ideas and write your ideas down. I mean, I've lost count of the number of times that I've had an idea earlier in the CTF, not written it down, got distracted by some other problem or barking up some other tree, and then I find out when I'm, you know, later in the CTF or when I'm reading write-ups that, oh, that was the answer. I mean, I was doing this one, it was actually the, the Ghost in the Shell Code teaser round last month, and there was a clue on a crypto problem, and it was this haiku. And way at the beginning of it, I'm like, oh, it's got to be some cryptographic key that's a haiku. And I did some Googling and looking around and was coming up with nothing, so I end up barking up a bunch of other trees, 
And I found out hours and hours later that, you know, oh, you know, somebody said something on IRC, and then somebody else said something on Twitter, and I kind of put two and two together. It's like, oh, that thing I was Googling hours ago, maybe I should try decryption key as opposed to cryptographic key. And boom, like the second result on Google had me going, and I had the answer like five minutes later. So I think it wouldn't have taken me like five hours to kind of come back to it if I had actually written down my ideas and kept track of my brainstorming. So, you know, this is kind of a crash course on what Capture the Flag is and how you can get involved doing it. Um, sorry, one more thing going back to the whole idea of finding a team, finding um, people to do it with. Seriously, it can be anyone. You know, if you're interested in doing CTF and you have a friend at a con who starts talking about CTF, ask if you can help them out with one. Join their team. You know, IRC, Twitter. You know, maybe you know five or ten people who are interested in doing it and want to get started. Even if none of you have ever done a CTF before, you come in with different backgrounds, different experiences, just to get together and do it. And how do you get together doing it? One is there's a website called ctftime.org, and it's got a calendar of Capture the Flag contests that are coming up. Another great resource for that and other things is Forgotten Sex CTF website. Forgotten Sex CTF website is awesome. Not only, <laughs> not only does it have a list of CTFs, you know, what month of the year they tend to fall, what cons are associated with, that sort of thing. It's got links to write-ups for solutions. It's got links to practice and war games. It's, it's got everything CTF on there. And if there's something that you know about CTF that's not on there, you can contribute to it. Um, one of my favorite directories for um, war games to practice on, because, you know, there's not necessarily a CTF every weekend that you can make, but it's good to practice on your spare time if you want to get better at it. captf.com slash practice CTF. It's got a nice, good quality list of places to go. Sorry, am I running out of time? One minute. All right, almost done. Um, bugs, session timeout and tunnel vision. Session timeout. Practice, practice, practice. Once the CTF is over, read CTF write-ups. Write your own write-ups of problems that you've solved. So one, it inks in your brain, and two, you can contribute back to the community. And you know, practice, practice, practice. The, be the, the best idea I've gotten for that is from my friend Wolf, who actually gave me the idea to give this talk in the first place. He has a goal that he does one CTF style problem every week. If you want to do more, that's cool, but if you shoot for one a week, it'll at least keep you going and keep you thinking. Finally, tunnel vision. When I started thinking about, hey, I should do CTFs, I thought they were all at cons. And I didn't want to spend my con doing the CTF. I wanted to spend my con talking to people and my time at home doing CTF. They're not all at cons. There are independent ones. There are ones at cons that you can participate in remotely. If you have time, if you have a spare weekend or a spare day, you can do a CTF. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> here, here, wait a minute. You can drink with Joe. Okay. <laughs> I got one too. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, of attacking, attacking time sources. Um, there's my information. So, I'm a time geek, okay? I grew up reading lots of time-based time books, you know, things, uh, science fiction, lots of movies. Good, thank you. Good combination of things. And then, yes, yeah, very interesting stuff. And yes, I do have a TARDIS here for those that really want to see the TARDIS. Hats are cool. And bow ties and hell no, I'm not tying it, okay? No, but I have my sonic screwdriver, so watch it. Okay, so... Um, one of the things that always piqued my interest is a specific attack that has to do with time of some sort. 
So cruising through Slashdot a while back, I suddenly saw this NTP glitch, which set time back. And I started asking question. What was the impact? Where was it? And I started looking at this pretty heavily. Um, I saw that uh, Sands put up some little short thing. Yes, this was a, this was a problem, kind of downplayed it. We saw a discussion on Active Directory and how a bunch of Active Directory domains had problems and it disabled Kerberos and authentication and other things. And I said, hmm, a time problem. I have to check this out. So the detail of the event, anybody from uh, uh, Naval Observatory here? <laughs> Just checking. I have this. So um, everybody knows Tick and Talk. Matter of fact, Tick and Talk are the most common, if you do a search, it's the most common referenced, recommended NTP server to connect to any place. So I found this kind of interesting. Um, what the problem was is um, Tick and Talk went a little bit mad. They essentially uh, shifted back 12 years. Well, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? So the collateral damage is that um, apparently while this was taking place, and I'm still going through the mapping process. By the way, this is an early part of the research I'm doing on this. Um, as I went through it, I found that a lot of organizations really didn't have a stratum one or stratum zero. What they were doing, sir? Was this November 2012? Was this happened? Yes, right. cool. 17th. Sorry. Um, so I found it kind of interesting that a lot of people were referring to these as, as themselves as stratum zero, stratum one, but they were actually stratum two, they were using other sources. And I started asking, hmm, what are the, some of the other questions? One of the collateral damage issues is a, a default configuration built, by de built across uh, all of our uh, Linux boxes that kills NTP if it has over a thousand seconds shift. We're going to talk about how to maybe exploit that. So I went deeper. This is a week's worth of research, searching, things like that. I found that a PBX, and they wouldn't tell me what type of PBX, but apparently this PBX went mad and was suddenly from the 70s, digital 70s, that's kind of strange. Um, we also had from this CTI group, I'm not sure who they would be, um, we also had multiple uh, servers synchronized, uh, Kerberos problems, AD authentication, people trying to get in through uh, VPNs, all kind of things. File write errors into their cloud service, their authentication service, I found that very interesting. And also we saw a bunch of Juniper routers have problems. Um, and then also discussions with friends living in this area. We have lots of friends at Nova Hackers. And it's interesting to have these discussions to say, do you remember this or can you pull logs on this? It was interesting how many people increase their help desk calls by fourfold for the staff trying to SSL in or their creds or for their uh, certificates for their web servers suddenly were not valid or all of a sudden their DNS cache went to zero. So everybody in the world had to go up to root to do queries. Kind of a problem. I also found, okay, at this time, we had a hurricane going up the east coast, and we also had a storm on the west coast. So what I did was I eliminated them from the discussion because that would be too evil to actually do a time attack and actually impact the electrical grid on the East Coast and West Coast. While something's going on, that would be too even, evil for even me to uh, think about. So what I did was I found two locations that were isolated from a weather standpoint that had a weird problem, but they were never able to describe why it was a problem. It was one of those magic problems. A, a um, screwdriver fell into the electrical grid and magically the west part of the West Coast, including San Diego, went black, you know, things like that. Um, it's interesting. I'm trying to find some more attribution. I'm, I'm, the big thing is to Google on news issues 
and Google isn't always the best source for news issues in this particular space. So what I'm doing is going down all the critical infrastructures. I've gone uh, down water and electrical. I still have eight more to go to see what the impact is. So this should be real interesting once I finish it. So then the other question I said, okay, which one of you saw this and said, okay, this is cool. So I found out my old friend FX presented it and said, ooh, on the NADDOG list and discussed it and then said, turning back the time, expired certificates, we already knew that. Um, and then he made a comment in the presentation in the video that this may be the first throwdown on a cyber war. Okay, drink, anybody else? I said cyber? He actually used the word cyber. Okay, drink, I, I see you over there. Oh, good, good. No more shots. Where's my shot? Win. What really concerned me was when I started doing searches on a lot of public sites, I started ending up with this thing called message not available. This started showing up every place I was looking with different queries. I had to actually go to source files and, and query it. Thing. Double shot. Woohoo! So this was this was kind of interesting, and I also noticed this um, woo, a lot, around a lot of particular uh, internet sites is that a lot of information was deprecated. So maybe something's going on. I don't know. Um, I have not contacted them, so there's no conflict of interest. But I found it kind of interesting. So. Very quickly, within one week, Google made this big announcement that they have this new True Time API, and they don't use NTP anymore. They actually use an atomic clock, which, by the way, are very cheap right now. You can buy an atomic clock chipset for uh, for about twelve hundred dollars. You can get it under two grand, which is pretty cool. And also GPS location. By the way, one of my other research projects is to find and exploit um, the GPS to actually shift time. And we'll talk about that maybe at the next presentation, because that's pretty evil too. Um, so here's a behavior for NTPD. Um, <laughs> when you shift time, NTP, NTP dies. It kills itself. And then the operating system said, damn, you died. I got to restart you. And then NTP says, look, I've just changed 12 years. And it accepts it. And that becomes the standard. When? OK. Well, I start thinking about, well, if I was doing a pen test or if I was doing a whatever, um, I would say, wow, this, would be, this could be useful. You know, it would be nice to have an SSL certificate suddenly expire from some set of websites, right? Um, so I found out that um, if you allow DNS, IP DNS spoofing, uh, you can actually set the time. And I'm going to show you an example I was using my Android phone and some other devices for. Um, also because, okay, this is another drink. Did, you, did anybody notice I didn't say IPv6 throughout the whole thing? Okay, well, another please. <laughs> no, only once. <laughs> Feel that? <laughs> um, because NTP doesn't have what they call happy eyeballs, which is what a web server ha or web browser has, it doesn't try to figure out v4, v6 transport, and then figure out A and quad A records. It only does v6, looks for quad A records, and then single A records, and then v4, and whatever. So you have a race condition here. That's kind of time, right? So you have a race condition here. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about the multicast thing, but that has some interesting implications, too. So Android behavior. So I said, hmm, Android, fun. I have several. Um, what can I do with it? So when I turned the GPS on, I suddenly noticed that NTP was being queried immediately. Hmm, what could I do with that? 
Then the GPS actually dealt with it. So I did a denial service. I basically uh, uh, routed the NTP query to 127.0.0.1. It failed, but then my GPS was never able to pick up. So what I did was I then turned around and lied to it. I said uh, I was six years ago. Suddenly the GPS came up when it succeeded, and I was not in this area. I was someplace else on the earth. So I found that kind of interesting. Um, so NTP spoofing can make your location be someplace else, especially during the initialization of a um, uh, location-based stuff. So another thing is I had this crazy Zeo program. OK, I track my sleep. I don't get a lot of sleep. Can you tell? Um, so um, I said, hmm. Let me use my Wi-Fi and spoof this. So I told it that I was going down to 1978, and all of a sudden, do you see the date? Look, I'm old. I wasn't even born there. OK, so this is really concerning. But it actually shipped, the application shifted back to 1920. So that was pretty interesting that we can shift time that far, and unfortunately, I don't have time to go through it, but there's actually four different time representations based on the application, based on the protocol, based on the operating system. And there's a lot of applications that don't have crossovers, don't understand it. And because of it, they misrepresent this, which makes the time shifting even worse, makes it pretty impractical. So then I started looking, and this is, a, uh, this is part of the research, hopefully for a DEF CON or Black Hat speech, um, going down all the wireless time protocols. So one of the first things I did was I called up the phone number to get time, and that's still both a dial-up 300, 1200, and 2400 baud modem. Um, and I also have the time synchronization. Yes, I know. I, I saw that. Um, but then we also have um, radio signals at multiple frequencies that actually put out pulses on a regular basis. Except there's one problem. None of them authenticated. Could this be a problem, especially if you could look at the top of a data center and go, ah, look, they've got an 800 megahertz um, receive for blah, blah, blah technology. Wouldn't it be cool if I happened to sit here and actually transmit that signal out? Do you think it would mess things up? Maybe. You're not recording the head shake, are you? Good. There we go. Um, protocols. These are just the four major protocols. There's actually another one, PTP, um, that we can go into extreme detail with. Four minutes. Three, two, one. No. I have ten. Win. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, these are some of the, these are the different protocols. Please don't use time protocol. Don't use daytime protocol. Guess what? Our Internet of Things, IoT, you know, whatever stuff, uses BusyBox. What does BusyBox use? Time protocol. Use a 32-bit, unassigned, unauthenticated, doesn't do any checking, this could be bad, maybe. So anyway, um, starting next week, I'm um, actually be fuzzing all these protocols to see both client and server if I can start breaking it. Do I have something on my nose? OK, thank you. Actually, I did back here, but I talked very quickly about it. Here, let me go back in time. OK. Right there, can you see it? Those three. Uh, and it worked very well. And that worked very well. That was basically a wireless access point with the NTP modified, which was pretty fun. Um, and that right there, I uh, got access to our Loran and realized that that was pretty broke. Um, so. What I did was to actually understand and create a framework around this so I could write a serious, 
academic, maybe more like a Matt Blaze academic versus the other academic. Um, type presentation, what I did was I started looking at what the time periods are that could be exploitable and could have benefit for the attacker. Well, thank you. So I started thinking about it. Wow, for minutes. Um, L, uh, Active Directory has a 15 minute timeline. So if you can shift the minutes 15 minutes, and you can do it once, uh, uh, once every minute. So you basically shift forward, shift back, shift forward. If an administrator is logging in remotely from a, say, VPN of some sort, SSL, you know, uh, IPsec, whatever, they have a little bit of a problem because their user authentication will never actually take because the certificates can never actually create a start and end time. So I started thinking about that. Certificates. Certificates are very fun. Cron times. What if I turned around and I never hit midnight? Wouldn't my log fill up? Couldn't I overwrite my log? Couldn't I force my log if I went back and forth to zero out for the next six weeks? Win. Um, so then I started looking at production stuff. Um, by the way, do you notice the thing where it says production, milliseconds, financial transactions? Uh, there is a congressional discussion that this could be the cause yeah. of the flash. Yeah. Yeah. Another one. Oh yeah, do it, do it. bastard. Do it. Okay. Here's the here's the type of attacks that I'm doing research on right now, which is how do I go forward and what is the impact? If I go backwards, what if I do long timelines? What is the impact on the processes? And also, also if I do short timelines. Can I actually meet the limit, as an example, with a Cisco router is so many hundreds of milliseconds before I actually can write a syslog? How about if I can retime re it so that I can actually never write a syslog for a specific incident? So anyway, this is the research and... Thank Wait. you. I'm assuming that was the reference, that, but. That <laughs> All right. So, so next up is going to be Wendy, and she's going to be giving the talk that's on the screen there. So just before everybody clears out, so tomorrow, what time or are we all going to be back here for Fire Talks? What? What time is it? I don't know. So. I don't know. No, it's 6.30, I believe, correct? Okay. Anyway, so ho hopefully we'll see you all back here to tomorrow night. And without further ado, oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you all for sticking around. I was... I, I, I can't follow a Time Lord. Well, maybe I'm not following him. Maybe I'm going before him in some... You're blowing my mind. In some alternate dimension, I actually went first. Um, I'm not doing any slides. I am going to talk about something completely different. And now for something completely different. Um, don't you hate it when somebody doesn't know what they're talking about? Don't you, don't you hate that? I know I do. I, I really hate that. Here is, some, here is an indicator that, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. This is not going to There we go. All right, we're good. Um, here is an indicator. Yes, I'm short. Here's an indicator. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, lower the... <laughs> All right, here's an indicator <laughs> when you don't know what you're talking about. And this thing really bugs me. If you refer to any institution, any company, any entity in the singular as if it were an animate object, like Google wants to track you. The government is out to get you. Microsoft hates me. 
any time, <laughs> the feeling is mutual, all of the above. Any time that you are referring to, so, to that sort of group in the singular, it's clear that you do not know what is going on behind the scenes. For one thing, nothing is a monolithic organization. If you have a group of people, they are all going to be doing their own things that you cannot possibly control. And most managers understand that. So if you hear something from a particular group, but it's really just from one person, you can be sure that afterwards some boss is going, I can't believe they did that. Or you said what during the press conference? So any particular given um, action that appears to be coming from an organization, you really need to understand that it is not necessarily representative of that organization. Here's another clue that you may not know what you are talking about, especially in security. When you say, why don't they just, or I can't believe that they did or didn't do something. If you can't believe it, or you don't understand why they can't do it, then you don't know the entirety of what's going on. I blogged about this recently in which I said, if you only play one position, then you don't understand the whole game. And this is a problem that we have in security. We are all looking at a lot of the same problems, but from very, very different perspectives. And one of the things that I want to encourage everybody to do, besides drink, <laughs> one of the things that I want to encourage everybody to do today, tonight, is to sit down with somebody who does not do the same thing that you do for a living. So for example, how many people break into things for a living? Raise your hand, pretty much. You de yeah, you deny everything, I know. <laughs> how many people get broken into for a living? Yeah, so there you go. How many people do neither one? Like you study people who break into things for a living and you study people who get broken into for a living. I'm not allowed to admit that. Yeah, you, you, you can't, yeah, you can't admit that. Exactly. And, and that's the other problem, is the other th problem obviously with securities. Nobody can stand up here and really talk about what's going on behind the scenes at their or in their organization. Nobody's going to come back and say, I can tell you exactly why we haven't patched for two years. And yet, there is always a really good explanation. If you sit down with that person and talk with them, there is always a good reason that made perfect sense at the time. If you can find out what that is, you will understand a lot more, not just about what that person is going through, but also you may be able to help them with that particular thing. So if you looked around at raised hands and you identified somebody who doesn't do the same thing that you do, I would encourage you to sit down and talk with them and talk with, ask them about a problem that they are having. Without agenda, without trying to further what you're doing, just ask them about a problem that they are dealing with. Learn as much about it as you need to and see what you can do to help them. I know this sounds very very Boy Scout, very Girl Scout. But a lot of us, and I've, I've been seeing this, you know, for weeks, for months, for years, today, this evening, a lot of us are very much in our own heads. And we look at everything through the lens of, is this going to help me? Is this going to protect me? Is this going to further what I believe to be right? Try to throw that away and just without any sort of agenda for yourself, find out what somebody else is doing. Sit down and talk with them. So uh, back to the title of this talk, does anybody know the, uh, the classic um, story of swinging from the 70s where married couples would go to somebody's house and... You know it, baby. Yeah, you know it, baby. <laughs> and the... Uh, the 70s? <laughs> that's that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You 
You and the other. There is a big difference, you're right. And there doesn't have to be. So think about that. So think about this. Everybody puts keys down, you know, the, 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 the men put, put their household keys down and the women come and just pick out of the pile and whoever, key, whoever belongs to those keys, they go home with them. We could do something similar here. Maybe USB keys. Everybody put USB keys in the middle. <laughs> you know, you, you pick that up, you go home with them. Yeah, exactly. Now that was at DEF CON I talked about being penetrated. That was something else. Um, now, I'm, please note, I am not saying that you should take this literally. If you pick up somebody's key, okay, if you really want to have sex with somebody, if they're the appropriate sex, if they like you too, then go ahead, knock yourself out. Go right ahead. Yeah, uh, it's safe surfing, no, no. Yeah. It, you know, go, go ahead and do that, but I'm not talking about... I'm just talking about an initial casual conversation. I'm not talking about setting up a mentor and mentee relationship. I'm not, I'm not talking about commitment. I'm not talking about moving in, and I don't want to change your life. But there's a warm wind blowing the stars around. Thank you, Thank you very much. That's to stop me singing. Thank you. I, I, I don't I don't know about two fisting. I don't I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do this. So although England Dan and John Ford Coley quote at Schmoocon, achievement unlocked. <laughs> um so but seriously some of us have done many different things in our careers. Some of us have been on the receiving end. Some of us have been on the giving end. Uh, some of us, yeah. It, it's that time of night, people. There's nothing I can say anymore that's not going to be taken the wrong way. Some of you like to watch. I'm sure there will be videos of this. There's a, we're on camera right now. We're on camera right now. Now, now's the time. They, nobody is storming the stage at this point. I don't understand. Yeah, I want my hug, yeah, my awkward hug right now. But seriously, please sit down with somebody else who does not do the same thing that you do and learn about what what challenges they are having to overcome. It's kind of like pulling a thread on a sweater, and when you start asking why something is going on and you pull on it and you discover there's something else going on. You know, for, for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For the, for the want of a horse, a battle was lost and so on. There's always something in security with a lot of really good reasons behind it. Whether it's why something is not getting patched, whether somebody is refusing to disclose a breach, why uh, why legislation is so bad, right? Yeah. Legislation is really hard to write. It's like writing secure code. You have to think about all the use cases and all the abuse cases, and you have to write it in a way that it's going to last for decades and not be misused. So sit down with somebody and try to understand what they are doing, help them solve a problem. Maybe it's just you know of a tool that they could use you know of somebody who could help them. You know somebody who's looking to hire somebody like them. There are a lot of possibilities here, and I think if we do this sort of swinging exercise, not only are we going to feel really nice and, and warm and fuzzy afterwards. Not saying swinging. <laughs> not that kind of swinging. <laughs> it will also help enrich your own understanding of security and your own ability to make a real contribution to the community. So at the risk of sounding too serious right now, I will just say, drink. drink. That's a good way to end, drink. Thank you all.